thank you for the, the warm welcome. It is a joy to be uh, with you. It's my second time to Lagos. I uh, love uh, the city and love the vibrant life that is in the city and love the gospel life that is in the city. And so it's a joy to, to hear Femi speak uh, uh, to us this morning. Um, it's in a sense overwhelming to stand up after Femi with uh, Femi being Femi and uh, try and follow uh, that. Um, and I, uh, uh, but uh, I'll pray for us in a second, maybe just to say one or two things um, in context. So I'm from South Africa, as Femi has mentioned. I'm a white African, grew up in South Africa, um, and have lived there um, all my life, except for a few years when I lived in the UK. I'll speak more about that in a second. Um, and uh, and so we uh, we uh, we love to banter with Nigerians. Um, uh, when Femi started at the beginning and he described the reality of life in Lagos, it sounded like it could have been South Africa that he was speaking about in some sense. And and often times when Femi and I uh, spend time together, you would say, "Oh, South Africa, you know, they're just exporting MTN and multi-choice and all of these things out to Lagos, and they're taking over the place." Well, you'll be glad to know that officially you're now the biggest economy on the continent. You know this, I'm sure, and you pride yourself in this. Uh, congratulations. So I was driving along the, along the road the other day, and I just started seeing Dangote signs everywhere. You know, so it's, it's revenge, it seems. Uh, and so uh, we rejoice with you guys. Femi uh, is in the business also of contextualization. I'll speak more about this in a second. But that's Femi actually supporting the Springboks um, in South Africa on his recent trip there. And so uh, it's a joy to be able to share these things on the continent. Just for the record, though, those beers are non-alcoholic. Um, um, I'm going to pray for us, and uh, then I'll speak into this topic of contextualization. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for your goodness. We thank you that we could be reminded of the good news of the gospel just now. Thank you for the way in which you have spoken into this world. And even just this morning, by your Spirit, reminded us of what the good news is. Lord, thank you that it's good news. Thank you that it's good news for all of Africa. Thank you that it's good news for Lagos, for Pretoria, for each city represented here, Lord. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are for our cities. Thank you that you love the people in our cities, that you have deep compassion on them. And Lord, thank you that this gospel is powerful to save. I pray that even as we speak about it now, that we would walk away from this being more clear about how to speak this good news so that people will actually hear it, so that people's lives will be transformed by the saving power of the gospel. And so we need you to work even now, Lord. I pray that you would be with us and have mercy on us for these few minutes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so um, we need to talk about... Uh, this gospel on the one hand that Femi has spoken about. You know, one of the questions, and Femi started out with this, is how do you explain what we see on our continent? So my, part of my job is, is, is I've got the privilege to travel around the continent. Um, and the one thing we do have on the continent is churches. We are flooded with churches on every corner. I mean, even here, it's a reality. It's certainly a rea reality where I come from. The gospel is preached so much. We often have, we have to ask the question... That, why is it having so little impact? Why is it having so little impact? I think Femi ventured into some of the answer uh, to this question. I think it's a complex uh, question, and so simple answers won't solve it. Um, but part of it needs to be said, that is exactly what Femi said, is because our gospel is often unclear. Our gospel is often half a gospel and therefore no gospel at all. Our gospel is often veiled or truncated or diluted, um, or changed in order to give people what the itching ears want to hear. And then we wonder why this gospel doesn't have this transforming power that the, that the Scripture says it should have. So there's one answer to the reason why this gospel isn't having more impact and changing our continent more effectively and more overtly. I think another reason is to do with this issue of contextualization. And I'll explain more what I mean by that phrase in a second. But I think it's because we have, uh, some of us who have faithfully stuck to the gospel has failed to explain that gospel in such a way that people can actually hear and understand that gospel. We haven't contextualized that gospel well for our continent. Um, and so that is a big claim to make. What do we mean by contextualization? That's all I'm going to do. I'm literally going to speak about contextualization 
three things I'm going to do is say what is contextualization, why do we need to do contextualization with this gospel, and then finally, how do we do it? So, contextualization is the process by which we present the gospel to a particular time and place and people in forms that the people, those that we present this gospel to, can actually understand. So that is what contextualization is. It is adapting gospel ministry. So listen carefully. It is adapting gospel ministry from one culture into another culture without compromising the essence and the particulars of the gospel itself. And so some of us are very good at adapting. Some of us are very good at sticking faithfully to the gospel. Not many of us are good at doing both of those things. So to put it in another way, contextualization is not giving people what they want to hear. Scripture is very clear on this. Paul speaks to Timothy and he says, there are some who will give people what their itching ears want to hear. And our cities are filled with churches that does exactly that. That's not what contextualization is. Rather, it is giving God's answers to the, people, to the questions that people in our culture and our context are actually asking. It might not be the answers that they want to hear, but it's giving God's answers, timeless answers, to the questions that people are actually asking. So often, as, as church pastors and ministers, we're very good at answering the questions that nobody is asking, isn't it? We've got a lot of explanations, a lot of time spent on our feet teaching people, but we're answering questions that nobody is asking. Because we're answering questions that somebody asked, maybe in a previous generation or in another country, but not the questions that our culture is actually asking. And so we ultimately end up with not giving them the full extent of the gospel. And so this is critical, friends. This is why some are skeptical and have reservations about uh, contextualization. Um, if you've not come across this term, this might not be an issue for you. But a lot of people are very skeptical around this idea of contextualizing the gospel to a certain audience. The reason they're critical of this is because there have been so many abuses. There have been so many abuses where people have, in the name of the contextualization, gone and made the gospel, tried to make the gospel more palatable, to make the gospel a little bit more acceptable, a little bit less offensive, all in the name of contextualization. And in all of, th all of these cases, friends, what they actually end up doing is they're valuing the culture into which they're speaking higher than scripture, higher than the gospel itself. And so we can't be doing that. That's not what contextualization actually is and what we're talking about. So yes, there are abuses, but contextualization can't be avoided. This is the other thing that we need to be clear on. It's inevitable. Whether you like it or not, and whether you th actually think about this or not, you are contextualizing. Every time you speak the gospel, everything you do in the life of a church it's actually some or the other form of contextualization. And I'll explain more what I mean by this in a second. But as soon as you choose words, as soon as you start speaking in a certain language, as soon as you dress a certain way, um, you ultimately are starting to contextualize. You become more accessible to some people and you move more towards them and less accessible to other people because you move away from them. Um, we can't help that. That is always going to happen. There's no universal presentation of the gospel for all cultures at all times uh, in the same, in, 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 in the same uh, way. Um, we need contextualization and we do this. And so just to put you at ease, the Bible does this. We've got four gospels in the Bible. They're written to different audiences. Uh, Matthew is written to a mostly Jewish audience, and so you get a lot of Old Testament references there so that the Jews have this context that helps the gospel make sense to them. Luke writes from a, from a, from a, from a Gentile background, and he writes to an audience that is very interested in the financial um, uh, the world and systems, and he, and he talks a lot about poverty. And so those gospels talk about the same Jesus, about one life that same Jesus lived. But they speak to different audiences, and contextualization is built into the way that even the, the scriptures come to us. Another example of this is Paul in Acts. In Acts 13, Paul speaks to Jews from a God, God fearers and Jews from, from a certain background, and he, he reasons with them in the synagogue and explains to them that Jesus is their Messiah. 
So he looks at the Old Testament and explains to them Jesus is their Messiah. Just a chapter later in, in Acts 14 or a few chapters later in Acts 17, you see Paul, Paul speaking to Gentiles and he doesn't go, go to the Old Testament. He doesn't use their scriptures because and, and what he does in Acts 17 is he uses their pagan philosophers and poets to reason for the reality that Jesus is the God of heaven and earth and the one that's coming back to judge. Paul is contextualizing. He reads who he's speaking to and as a result, he takes this one unchanging gospel message and adapts the way he speaks it so that the people that he's speaking to can actually hear this message. So the question is not whether you are contextualizing. Uh, we are all doing it. Um, the question is whether we're doing it well or poorly, uh, ultimately. The question is whether we're doing it rightly or wrongly. And that brings us to another thing that we need to talk about as we talk about contextualization is this idea of culture. See, we live in a world that has got many different cultures. In a city as diverse as Lagos, uh, there are many different cultures. Even in this room, there are many different cultures represented. Um, and it's often, often not that obvious to outsiders, but if you live in this place, it's very obvious to you. There are cultures and subcultures on every second corner in the city. Um, Culture ultimately is that what we do without thinking about what we do. It's that which comes naturally to us. And so oftentimes, if you're not aware of this, it's probably because you live in a culture where you are the majority. People who are a minority in that culture are very aware of these things. Majority people think that this is just the way it's, things are being done. Uh, and other people have got a culture, but they don't have a culture themselves. But when you exit your own culture and you go to another culture, you just realize so many things are very different in another place and time. The, the mistake we make, and especially if you live in a majority culture, is that you think your culture is the way, or is somehow superior, or even if you wouldn't say it that way, you might say it's even more biblical. But friends, we need to be clear um, that we can, all of us, can, in, can treat cult culture in one of two different ways. You can either under-adapt to culture or over-adapt to culture. Um, to under-adapt to culture or to under-contextualize, here's what I mean by that, is that we put unnecessary stumbling blocks in people's way and we, we put a certain bar there to say they need to clear this bar in order to hear the gospel. And so what we ultimately do is we make culture something that is more to be confronted than something that we embrace. Um, uh, so culture is bad, is what we typically say. The world out there is bad and everything in the world out there is bad. And so what you need to do if you want to become a Christian, what you need to do if you want to become part of this church, is you need to start behaving like us before you necessarily believe like us. Um, and that is putting a stumbling block in people's way if we under-adapt to culture. What we end up having is people potentially having a cultural conversion. Uh, what, they, what they do is they become like us. They don't necessarily believe like us. And nominalism that Femi spoke about earlier is expert at doing this. I think that's typical all over Africa. Is that we have a lot of people, because our world is fairly Christianized, that behave in a certain way. But ultimately, they don't believe like we believe. And we haven't done the hard work of actually adapting to the culture. We'll talk about how we do that in a second. But that's under-adapting to our culture. And we see that uh, frequently. One of the old ways in which this happened was the old school missionaries that came to our continent and gave us the gospel that has done so much good on this continent. And we need to acknowledge that. But at the same time, what they've also done is brought their culture with them and expected us to leave our culture and adopt their culture as if that culture is in some way superior. Uh, we see that uh, that's, that's the old school way of doing it. And so we see that in expecting us to dress in a certain way like they did in 18th century England or, or do music in a certain way or preach in a certain style. We sometimes do it today. If we look at what, what works, for instance, in Houston, Texas, and we just take that and implement that over here. We do that same thing, isn't it? We say, oh, that's working, and so let's take that same thing and do that over here. Instead of thinking, well, what does Lagosians actually need? What are they like? And so we under-adapt to culture. That's the one extreme. The other extreme is to over-adapt to our culture, is to over-contextualize. 
That's where we embrace our culture and the world around us. But we never actually challenge that culture. Uh, what we ultimately end up doing is we lose the offense and therefore the power of the gospel. Um, the, gospel the, the offense and the power of the gospel is taken away and nobody is ultimately changed because ultimately we create a church that is just like the culture instead of different to the culture. And so ultim ultimately the only thing that people get from us is a Christianized version of their own culture and not something that's authentically biblical. So examples of that in Africa uh, is plenty. Syncretism in some form or another exists. I think a lot of us would reject that. But I think even some of the prosperity gospel teaching is uh, over-adapting to what we hear people say they need and, and, and giving them a gospel in such a way that it actually creates a whole new system, a, a whole new culture. And that's over-adapting to the culture. And so, in summary... Contextualization is a process by which we take the unchanging gospel, unchanging truth of the gospel, and, com and communicate that in a way to a culture that is changing rapidly the whole time. And so that means we need to adapt to this culture. And so question for us, are we adapting the way we communicate the gospel in such a way that Lagosians in 2018 can actually understand this gospel and all segments of society can actually hear this unchanging gospel that we heard this morning. That is the what of contextualization. Why should we be doing this? Why should we be concerned for doing this in the first place? Um, there's a danger in not contextualizing or thinking that you aren't. As we said, we're all doing it, but there's a danger in thinking, oh, it's not, ne not necessary or I'm not doing it. You see, if we never deliberately think through um, the culture that we live in um, and never think deliberately about ways to, to contextualize the gospel to our culture and our ministry styles to a new culture, what we end up doing is unconsciously just taking an old way of doing ministry and an old way of preaching from somewhere else and giving that to the culture that we live in. Uh, so as an example, I said I lived in England for some time. I'm originally from South Africa, moved to England when I was 25 or something. Uh, I became a Christian there, and I was struck by God's grace in saving me in this place. I thought I was going to the land of the pagan, and I realized I'm the pagan. And God so mercifully saved me, and I, I spoke to some of the guys in the break. I so, I'm so convinced of the way the Lord uses immigration to save people. You, they unset, he unsettles you from one place so that it actually opens your ears to hear the gospel in another place. So I get saved. Um, I get very involved in an Anglican church. Of all things, I'm not English. And, and, and I was brought up to understand and believe that the real problem with the world is the English. Um, I realize that's not completely true. Um, <laughs> And so, yeah, I live in England. I sit in an Anglican church uh, that, is, that is the Lord has used to save me. I'm convinced that, uh, that the Lord is calling me back to, to, to minister to my own people back in South Africa. And so I end up moving back to South Africa. And the biggest temptation is to take literally what I've seen in England, what works, and give that to my people. Now, you need to know that that will seriously not work where I come from. I needed to go back and actually learn that if I don't actually stop and ask hard questions, and it's really hard because it's so much easier to just take, take this thing, it works. Take this thing and give it to these people. Do church in the way that they've done it. Uh, it would be so much easier than doing the hard work of saying, well, what does it take for people in this culture to actually hear the gospel? And so ultimately, friends, if we don't do it, we will end up giving people just what we've been given um, without giving them what will make, really make them hear the gospel and be transformed by that gospel. You see, if, if I went back to South Africa with this gospel, what I would have said is that that cult culture is somehow superior. What I would have said is that way of doing church is somehow superior to another way of doing church. Um, and so we need to ask when we look at culture, we need to ask, uh, is that right? Is it wrong? Do we accept it? Do we challenge it? Do we change it? And so as we, as we ask this question of why contextualize, I just, want to, I, I just want to do two things. The one is I want to give us a biblical basis for doing it. 
And I want to give us a biblical motivation for doing it. Um, the biblical basis for, for um, contextualization is that we need to understand the nature of culture according to Scripture, according to God. Culture is not neutral. Uh, culture is mixed. Um, and so culture in, 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 in what exists around us in a city like Lagos is something that is very mixed. Uh, one, uh, Romans 1, 19 to 20. Um, we, we're not going to uh, have time to look at that in detail. But Romans 1, 19 to 20, I'll read that to you. Um, Paul says, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. What Paul is saying there is there's general revelation. God has made the world in a certain way. God's character can be seen in the world around us. And so non-Christians, Christians, non-Christians non that live in a place like Lagos can see something of God's goodness and God's character by looking at the way the world is made. By looking at people around them in the city. Every culture will have some witness to God's truth in it. This is very important for us to recognize. There is no culture that is, that, is, that, is, that is broken because of the fall to the point that there is not something of God's goodness and God's truth to be perceived in that culture. Romans 2, 14 and 15, Paul goes on just a few chapter, uh, verses later. And he says the following. He says, uh, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bear witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse them or even excuse them. What Paul is saying is the, God, the, the, the law is written on people's hearts. In every culture, you will have people, non-Christians, um, seeking to do the right thing and achieving much good. We need to recognize that as Christians. Sometimes we can be so against culture. Everything is wrong there and everything is right here. But we need to recognize that the Bible doesn't see it that way. There's so much of God's goodness built into the world around us to be seen for people. And it's written on our hearts. The law is written on our hearts. And so we shouldn't be surprised when we see a lot of non-Christians doing lots of good things around us. We should even be able to celebrate that and saying that is a good thing. Praise God for that. But Romans 1.18, so going back just a few verses earlier. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against the godliness, ungodliness and unrighteousness of man who by their unrighteousness suppress that truth. There's a lot of that truth that is to be celebrated and seen in culture, and yet man suppresses this truth. And so culture is mixed. All cultures on earth, somewhere, wherever you find it, is in some way a mixture of the good and the bad. And so as we, as the church, look towards culture and the culture around us, we should have this, this ability to, on the one hand, uh, critically enjoy culture, look at the things that exist around us, and at the same time have an appropriate weariness. Uh, an appropriate suspiciousness of it to say that we need to evaluate this in the light of God's word. And that's true for every culture. And so there we have the first thing. We have a basis for contextualization in the fact that the, the way the Lord has made this world in which we live. Culture is in and of itself mixed. Um, some of it is good, some of it is bad. And our job is in a sense to evaluate that at the end of scripture. But God also gives us a motivation for contextualization so that we would proactively contextualize our gospel message. And that takes us to 1 Corinthians 9, verse 19 to 23. 1 Corinthians 9, and, and some of you would be very familiar with this passage. Um, this is probably the most famous passage where Paul explains his method. In other places we see how he actually does this. This is the place where he explains why he does um, does things the way you do. And, and, and this is helpful for us because it should shape our motivation for contextualizing. And so 1 Corinthians 9, verse 19 to 23. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. Now, I, w I just want to stop, stop there, verse, verse 19. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, 
that I might win more of them. Paul says, I've made myself something I am not. I've made myself, I've consciously gone through the effort of becoming something I am not. And so we need to see that, friends. That is servanthood. This is Paul saying, I'm, I'm serving, I've become a servant of all non-Christians. It's important, and let me just take a step back. So often we don't think, uh, we think about the people that are sitting in front of us every Sunday, and we assume they're all Christians. And we're not proactively thinking about those on the outside. This is Paul saying, I'm thinking about those on the outside. I'm here to serve them, and I'm becoming something I'm not in order to serve them. Uh, this is what contextualization is about, uh, ultimately. And then he goes on, that I might win more of them. This is why I do it, ultimately. This is the motivation. And then he goes on, verse 20. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win the Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win more of those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. Five times over he says, the purpose is that I might win them over. I've become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. Paul knows he's not going to save all of them, but he's going to try. He's going to try that he might save those that have been called by God for eternal life. And he becomes their servant. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. And so, friends, that is the heart of gospel contextualization. It's becoming a servant in order to win those on the outside. The purpose is to win people to Christ. Our job, our job as ministers of the gospel, and I believe that's what most of us here are in some way, we, 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 we give our lives to seeing the gospel being proclaimed inside the church and outside the church. Our job is to express the gospel message, what Femi gave us this morning in session one, to every culture, uh, and to the one I'm called to reach in particular. Uh, to express that gospel message in a way that doesn't make it alien or foreign to that culture. And yet to do that without removing the, the scandal and the offense of biblical truth. And that is a very, very hard thing to do. The reason we don't do that is because it's servanthood. It's because it means becoming something we are not. Um, and so it's uh, clear and attractive. That kind of gospel, a well-contextualized gospel, is clear and attractive to people. They sit up and they would say, even in a nominal world where people have been in church their whole lives, would sit up to that kind of gospel and they say, that's clear, that's attractive, that is unlike anything I've heard before. And at the same time, it's so challenging and so confronting, unlike anything I've heard before. And so this is the basis for faithful, fruitful ministry. See, if we go back to our original question is why don't we see more um, transformation in the lives of the people on our continent where the gospel is so widely preached? It's partly because we've adapted the gospel um, and com compromised the gospel, but it might also be that those of us who have faithfully stuck to this gospel are speaking in a language and in a way that just makes people's eyes glaze over. It's boring in some way. They say, so what, um, with the message that we bring to them. And friends, that's not because the message is boring. That's not because the message isn't relevant. The onus is on us to be servants of this word and of those people. Um, so that everyone in Lagos, this is why we do this, so that everyone in Lagos or in Ibadan and in Abuja and in Accra, so that everyone can hear the gospel in a language that makes sense to their hearts. This is ultimately what this is about. And this is why we need to plant many different churches. The reality is, friends, we can't, Paul is saying, I became all things to all people so that I might win some of them. You can't do that to all people at the same time. And so we need to be willing to target certain groups of people. We need to start certain churches that reach a certain kinds of people in certain areas to reach some people specifically with the gospel in their heart language. Uh, and so that's what we're about if we do contextualization well. Al just reminded me of this um, yesterday. I've, I've not seen this before, but Ecclesiastes 10.10 10 says, If the axe is dull and its edge, edge unsharpened, more strength is needed, but skill will bring success. And if you extrapolate from that biblical wisdom to this idea, 
We are about fruitfulness. Contextualization is ultimately about, ultimately about achieving more gospel fruit because we're sharpening this gospel axe so that when we wield it, so that when we proclaim it, so that when we live it out, it actually yields more fruit. More people are saved as a result of the fact that this gospel is coming to them in their heart language, in the way that they actually understand it. And so that's the what of uh, that's the why of contextualization which brings us friends to the how of contextualization everything about a church must be contextualized um, so often when we talk about these things and someone was doing a session later today on gospel preaching so often we reduce contextualization to preaching um, so often we reduce church even to preaching um, but the gospel is big the gospel encompasses all of life. Part of our problem is that we've truncated it and made it something that is there for Sunday mornings. And so everything about our church must be contextualized. And all seven days of our lives, our lives as the pastors of those churches, the lives of our peoples, need to be contextualized. Um, it's message, it's discourse, the way we make decisions at our church need to be done in the light of the way our culture around us typically would do these things. Our leadership, uh, our worship on a Sunday, the way we engage with politics and the arts in this culture needs to shape the way we do church ultimately if people are going to sit up and understand and hear our gospel. And so what we need, as we've said, is we need many churches doing it in very different ways. The worst thing we can do is copy and paste what others are doing. Uh, so how do we do this? How do we do this? And this is probably worth a, a, a university course over the, over the space of a year, but just three key things we can do to help us um, contextualize well. We need, to do, we need to understand three things well. We need to understand our culture. Um, I think some of us spend a lot of time studying scripture and that is a great thing and we're going to get to that in a second. But the first thing we probably need to do is understand our culture a little bit better. Um, some famous English preacher has said that you need to walk with the Bible in the one hand and a newspaper in another hand. And that is probably right. We need to understand our culture and study our culture more than we typically do. We need to study the demographics of a place like Lagos and not just the city as a whole, but a specific area and understand who it is that we are going to target. And that brings us to that next thing, friends. We need to target certain groups of people in the city. Um, ultimately, if we try and reach everybody, we will reach nobody. Um, and so we need to be willing to say that we'd love to see our church become multi-everything in its diversity over the space of time. But as we set out to plant a church, as we set out to reach certain people, we need to say, what is it going to take to reach these people? And we need to study them. We need to study their culture. We need to know who we are speaking to. We need to know what it is that they are actually asking. Um, we need to become all things to all people, but a certain amount of people in a specific place and time. And the way you do that, the way you study this culture is ultimately to listen. I think we're so quick to speak and slow to listen, which is the inverse of what we're called to do. We're so quick to have answers, uh, but we're not willing to really humbly listen to people around us. And specific, specifically to non-Christians, we sometimes, uh, to, to, to people on the outside, we look down on them um, as if we have all the answers. And so what is needed, I think, is for us to stand back and listen very humbly, uh, very attentively to those on the outside and listen to two things. What do they live for? Uh, what do they long for? What is the things that they really yearn and desire? Um, because somehow, if the gospel story that we heard this morning is the story of stories, that thing that is in their hearts is only to be answered by the gospel. That thing that they really desire if they're made in the image of God is ultimately only to be found in the gospel. And we need to listen to what they really long for and what they really yearn for. Friends, they ultimately have misplaced loves. So, so nowadays there's a, there's a rediscovery of this idea that ultimately one way to... Th ultimately, um, sin is idolatry. It's rejecting one God for the sake of other gods. It's saying, I'm going to love this thing more than I'm going to love that God. And that is true for all of us, in a sense. 
And that's true for everybody around us. Um, and we need to determine what those idols are. What are these things that people are looking to, uh, to fulfill their desires, that they're looking for love in? Um, and so that's the one thing we need to listen to, listen for in our culture. The other thing that we need to listen for is how do people make decisions? How do people actually make decisions? And so maybe ask, ask yourself this. There are three typical ways, and I'll go to a Bible passage just briefly um, to, to, to show how Paul even does, does this. Um, but how do people make decisions? Tell me how do you make decisions in, in, in your heart. Um, there's some of us that are thinking people, and we make decisions based on logic. So we will ask the question, well, what makes sense? Um, there are some of us that only operate in that way. But there are some of us that would say, well, I, and maybe we won't acknowledge it this way, but I do what feels right. So I make decisions based on emotion. Some of us make it on logic with our minds. Some of us make it on emotion with our hearts. And there are some of us that just makes it with our hands. We're pragmatics. Uh, we do whatever works. And if you speak to people who make decisions in this way or that way or the other way, you need to realize that the gospel will probably be received by them in different ways. So, a classic example of this is Acts 16. So just before Paul speaks in the Oropagus, in Acts 17, we find him in Acts 16, Paul and Silas. And they encounter three people. The one is Lydia, who is a rich, wealthy woman um, in that area. Um, he finds a slave girl in that area. Um, who's, who's a Gentile and a slave girl, the lowest possible class. Lydia is the highest possible class. Uh, the slave girl is the lowest possible class. And then the third story in Acts 16 that we have is the Philippian jailer. He's probably somewhere in the middle, and he's a, he's a Roman. Um, and, so, and so Lydia is probably somebody who is in, in, in the elite class in that society, wealthy. And Lydia makes decisions probably in terms of logic, what makes sense. Paul speaks to her, and so do yourself the favor and go to and look at this in Acts 16. Paul goes after and speaks to her by explaining in a very logical way that Jesus is the Christ. Paul goes after her by engaging her in her mind because that's the way that Lydia operates. Right after that, Paul meets the slave girl. That's demon possessed. And what she what she the, the way she probably makes decisions is by what feels right. And Paul um, uh, rescues her from this demon possession, and she is converted and saved as a result of that. She wouldn't have responded to a gospel message that is based on what is um, logic. Uh, she responds to something that actually changes her life, to something that actually feels right. And then the third person we have there is the Philippian jailer. Uh, what happens in this story is, is absolutely amazing if you look at it closely is that um, the, uh, uh, Paul and Silas is thrown into jail. They're beaten badly by this guy and his friends, thrown into jail, put in shackles. Then the, the jail opens, and this guy wants to kill himself because he realizes that they, that they, that they must have escaped. And this is going to mean ultimate shame for him, and he will be executed because he didn't execute his duties. And he's about to kill himself, and then Paul and Silas, who did not run away, who did not use the opportunity stops him and says don't do that and so what ultimately they give him is they save his life they give him grace and that's the thing that God uses to change him and so here's a man that operates not on the basis of logic not on the basis of emotion but on the basis of what works and he sees this gospel works this gospel saved my life and God uses in different ways through Paul different experiences of people to save them in different ways we all know this there's no two conversion stories that are the same. And so we need to be willing to go out there and become servants of people and communicate in a language, in their language, in order that they might be saved. So we need to understand our culture, number one. We need to, secondly, understand the Bible. Friends, we need to be clear that the Bible ultimately is authoritative and sufficient. Uh, when we talk about contextualization, the only thing that will allow us to do this really well is a very firm conviction that the Bible is true and it's always true for all people. The thing that will allow us to engage with people and to start experiment by doing church in a certain way that engages their culture is if we have this deep conviction that the Bible doesn't change. 
and that the Bible's truth is truth for all people, no matter where they're from, no matter where they are. It's good news for all people. There's nothing out there that can save people outside of the Bible. And if we study the culture and we study Scripture and we run with that Scripture to people, that ultimately will, will allow them to hear this gospel in a way that will save them. We need to go back to the Bible with confidence that the Bible has got answers to those questions that people are asking. The Bible has got everything to say on people's questions about wealth and sex and power and money and whatever else the questions are. The Bible has got the answers to those questions. Um, quick example of that in South Africa, there's, I don't know whether this is a Nigerian thing, there's a lot of talk about decolonizing the gospel. Um, and so that's very popular in South Africa at the moment. And uh, and I and I actually think so. So I actually think there's a lot of good in that movement. Uh, so one of the guys that are planting a church in out of our little network there, has started talks on uh, the the guy that led the Black Consciousness movement in South Africa in the 1960s, Steve Beaker. Maybe you've you've heard that name. He was um, killed by the apartheid government. Um, Beaker was uh, started the black consciousness movement. So, well, he didn't start it. He led the black consciousness movement and is the intellectual voice that gives power to them today. This guy in planting a church has started something in order to contextualize and engage culture called Beaker and Jesus, Conversations with Beaker and Jesus. Because he knows everybody out, the, out there are, is talking about decolonizing literally everything, decolonizing education, decolonizing including decolonizing Jesus. Um, and he has gone and actually sat down with Biko and read Biko and understands Biko well and at the same time said, yes, this, yes, Biko. But Biko and Jesus doesn't sit in two chairs next to each other. Jesus sits on a throne in heaven. Um, he's not the same. And so that's a classic example of understanding my culture but having the confidence that Scripture is, 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 is not on par with my culture. And, but Scripture has something to say to every culture, regardless of where we're from. And then finally, understand the culture, understand the Bible, and understand ourselves. Um, understand ourselves and the leadership that the Lord has entrusted to us, the people around us. Ultimately, we as a church will only most likely reach those that are most like us. Um, and so it's one thing for us to feel called to reach, reach a certain people, uh, but it might be that God is calling most of us to reach people that are most like us. But because we are so ingrained in that culture, oftentimes we're lazy at doing that uh, work of contextualizing to that culture. And so we need to understand the culture, we need to understand the Bible, but we need to understand ourselves as well and do some hard work there. I, I'm going to close with this thought. Um, Paul says, I became a servant of all. I think the reason I, I fail to do contextualization well is because I'm, I'm, I'm not willing to, to serve. I'm not willing to serve those on the outside. Uh, especially if you've been in ministry for a while, there's so much to serve on the inside. There's so, there's so much to just keep this, that needs to be done to just keep this thing going. Um, but Paul says, no, 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 I became a servant of those on the outside in order to win them. It's not quick. It's not comfortable. But we need to be proactively moving towards those outsiders, pursuing those on the outside, those that are different to us. And the question is, what will get us to do that? What will get us to be sacrificial enough to actually lay down our, our rights? What will get us to lay down our comfort um, to pursue those on the outside, to become all things to all men, to become like them? Well, friends, it's ultimately, if we remember, that we were those on the outside and somebody came for us. And I'm not just talking about that someone, that person that loved you into the kingdom. We probably all have stories of somebody that did that for us and somebody that came after us and loved us into the kingdom of God. I'm not talking about them as much as that is a great thing that God has done through them. I'm talking about the God of heaven that left his throne, that put, took off his crown in heaven, that came to earth, to pursue people like us. He was the one that ultimately became something that he was not in order to rescue sinners like us. And it's only if we realize at a deep level that what Jesus did was to serve me that I would be willing to serve others by contextualizing and becoming something that I'm not in order to win some.
And so I'm going to stop there. I think we might have some questions on that later. Um, but let me pray for us, uh, and then I'll head back to Femi.